Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Schneider. I am the archivist at the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, and I'm seeing us and the lecture series this evening. Um, so this evening's pro is based on the lost family by Libby Copeland, who is here on um, spot screens. Uh, Bernie Hirsch, who is also here with me, will be moderating. So and, uh, good evening, and thank you for joining us for a virtual installment of the Jim Schwartz Annual Lecture Series. The Cultural Phenomenon of Home DNA Testing, presented by author and Copeland. Ongoing for well over 10 years, bringing in locally and nationally on subjects of interest to the Dallas Jewish community, our annual lecture series has been information and awareness of aspects of Jewish and Southern history and culture. In 2019, we renamed our series to honor Jim Schwartz of Blessed Memory, 2016 president of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Jim's community interest, but he will be remembered most for his work with the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. A strong remembered for the remarkable strides made at the Dallas Jewish Historical Society during his four years as president. Maintaining strong fiscal responsibility, offering meaningful and programs and fundraising events, and being instrumental in moving the organization forward in delivering archival digitization, best known for his warmth and, I apologize if I butchered that, as well as his dedication to the growth of the Dallas Jewish Society, we are thrilled to have this opportunity to honor him with this annual lecture series. Let our executive director, Deborah Polsky, also of blessed memory, who uses these programs for us with a few words, passed away unexpectedly last week. She was really to this evening having uncovered some unexpected results and not actually related relatives with her own ancestry and 23andMe test results. It was her personal interest of DNA testing as a branch of genealogical research that motivated her to contact Ms. Copeland to our lecture series. Tonight's moderator, Bernie Hirsch, was recently reacquainted with the when he participated in our Judaica Roadshow program this past January. Bernie presented his family to the 17 and 1800s or 1800s. His long-standing interest in genealogy momentum prior to the birth of his first child. He has since spent thousands of years researching his friends, Rajgrad Poland, Novo Grodok, Vasilishki, Lithuania, Germany, and Ireland, and documenting thousand people in his tree. Coincidentally, Bernie told me his father was researching the human gene in 2015 reading the book Inheritance, How Genes Change Our Lives and Our Lives Change Our which is now an area of interest for Bernie as well. With that, I give you Mr. Bernie Hurt to moderate the rest of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And I'd like to introduce Libby Copeland. Libby Copeland is an award-winning journalist and author who writes from New York about culture and science. As a freelance journalist, she writes for such media outlets as the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and Smithsonian Magazine. Her book, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, published by Abrams in 2020, explores the rapidly evolving phenomena of home DNA testing, its implications for how we think about family and ourselves, and its ramifications for American culture broadly. The Wall Street Journal says, it's a fascinating account of lives dramatically affected by genetic sleuthing. The New York Times writes, before you spit in that vial, read that book, read this book. The Washington Post says the lost family reads like an Agatha Christie mystery and wrestles with some of the biggest questions in life. Who are we? What is family? Are we defined by nature, nurture, or both? It was named to the Guardian's list of the best books of 2020. And Libby, I am so pleased to be here with you today. Thank you um, for having think, me. Thank you. We're honored. We're all honored. Um, I really enjoyed reading your book so, so much. Um, like I was saying earlier, just like I was addicted and like a Netflix <laughs> sleuthing. Just, and I'm amazed in retrospect after get, getting, getting through it all, how you were able to like join journalism and literary literary storytelling with sociology and bioethics and morality and psychology. And it goes on and on and on all the way to philosophy and big data. 
So, you know, I just enjoyed that because I like that sweet spot too that you that I think yeah. you love. Yeah. Um, so let's, I mean, I'm looking forward to this discussion. So like, first off, how did you come to write The Lost Family? How yeah. DNA testing is up any who we are? Yeah, so thank you. And thank you for that very kind description. Um, I do think that it's a very like, you know, it's a lot of fields that come together in our understanding of, of genetic genealogy because like, really this discussion is about humanity and identity, all these like huge kind of things. Um, and so, you know, to explore it, you have to kind of go, <laughs> there's so many different ways in, and I wanted to kind of, um, I wanted to tackle it from another, a number of angles. Um, I got interested, so I used to be a reporter at the Washington Post, and one of the things I loved to write about was um, sort of this intersection of culture and tech and marketing and um, other kind of forces that influence and shape the values in our culture. Uh, so sort of how do we decide what we value and how do we decide who we are and how, how we identify ourselves? Um, and um, I had a long st standing interest in science. Um, my family was into genealogy. We had done DNA testing in some form um, going back to, to you know, the 15 years. Um, and I started hearing stories about um, DNA testing surprises, you know, this kind of, kind of phenomenon as the, as the market was growing and as more people were buying these home DNA test kits for $100, I started hearing more and more stories about people who took a test on a lark thinking that it was like no big deal, no big investment. And then they found something that like really upended their assumptions about their own lives and their family and their, their personal history um, and how big that was. And I was entranced by this juxtaposition of the kind of low effort, low cost investment with this kind of massive outcome. And, you know, you're, you're kind of always interested in how people grapple with changes in their identity, but, the, but DNA testing, consumer DNA testing is like nothing we've ever seen before because, well, there have always been families where people discovered, oh my gosh, I'm not, you know, I just discovered somebody told me <clears throat> my dad's not genetically related to me, you know, and my, my, my genetic dad is actually this neighbor, right? There've always been those stories in families. Um, but we've never had a time where we have had so many people make that kind of discovery en masse without actively trying to find out, you know, they were, many of them were never even asking those questions and they were just sort of having it come to them because they took a test, because they saw an ad, because they wanted to find out how Irish they were, right? And so that was interesting to me. And I wanted to, I wanted to write a book that would go into deep into this idea that um, when you get into genealogy, you are essentially on a kind of a, in many ways, it is a bit of a detective story. Um, at its best, at its finest, you are asking the question, not who done it, but who am I, right? When you are using DNA to help you with that journey, you're combining genealogical research with DNA, you are accessing information that would have been completely impossible to access just 20 years ago. You are peeling back the layers of an onion that was previously completely inaccessible and you are answering questions that would have been, you know, inco you know in incoherent a generation ago. It's, it's absolutely stunning. So the possibility of learning this much about yourself, it truly is it truly is like, like a kind of an Agatha Christie, right? It truly is a mystery. And so when I set out to tell a story, I wanted to tell many stories and I wanted to kind of have a single narrative as well that would pull you through because it would be, I was hoping as riveting as an Agatha Christie, but in, again, instead of the question of who killed Ms. Jones, the question would be, you know, what, what am I? What makes me up? Who am I when I see myself in the mirror and what, what does it mean if I suddenly don't recognize myself anymore? Thank you. So the story of Alice Collins' playbook, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but you she framed it. I got it? Okay, good. She frames yeah. your book. No spoilers, but because everybody's definitely have to read this. Could you explain why her quest provides such a powerful window into home recreational or home DNA testing? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 
when you're writing a book about science for a general audience, you know, there's going to be like a lot of like sort of heavy topics and words that, you know, you have to define. And so I didn't want it to be work. And I thought Alice's story should, should be like the propulsion that pushes you through so that you then it's like supposed to be basically the yummy thing, right? So then, then you are able to eat your spinach on the side <laughs> and learn some of these DNA terms and, you know, but that it shouldn't feel too onerous because it's, it should be accessible to listen, DNA science should be accessible to all of us because so many tens of millions of us are doing it, right? So we should know what we're doing. Um, and so Alice's story is just this completely astonishing tale that when I first heard it, I thought this cannot be true. Um, and then I started reporting it and I was like, oh my gosh, it is true. This is more than it started as an article for the Washington Post, but I knew it was a book. Um, so basically Alice is this person who believes that she's Irish on both sides. She takes a DNA test back in 2012 at the dawn of consumer DNA testing. So these companies like 23andMe and Ancestry um, are just kind of getting on the market. They're, even what they're offering is probably very much more crude compared to um, what, what they offer now. Um, and basically, she had been doing genealogy for some time, and she just wanted to get a little bit more precise with it. You know, she wanted to know, like, which county in Ireland a particular side of grandparents came from. But she knew her story. She knew that one, her mother's side was Irish and English and Scottish. She knew her father's side was totally Irish because her grandparents were actually Irish immigrants. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of, like, who am I questions. It was more just, like, how precise can I get? Maybe I can find some cousins in Ireland and meet up with them. Um, and instead, what she found was that she takes this test through um, Ancestry first, and it comes back with this bizarre sort of um, amalgam of, of numbers and um, colors and graphs that don't make sense. And she starts to investigate it. Basically, what it adds up to is that she's apparently half Ashkenazi Jewish, and she doesn't even know the word Ashkenazi. She doesn't even know how to pronounce it. That's how foreign this is to her, right? This concept, like, what's that? Um, so she thinks, okay, like definitely like this science isn't there yet because I know that I'm not Jewish. I've got to be Irish and, you know, British Isles. Like, so, you know, probably Ancestry hasn't vetted their test yet. Uh, she does some research. She finds 23andMe. She takes their test. The results come back and half Ashkenazi Jewish. And now she's like, oh my gosh, I have a mystery on my hands. What is happening, right? Only it's 2012, which is over 10 years ago. And the databases are very, very small. And so she sets out to, do, to kind of solve her mystery. And because the databases are small and because her mystery is very unique and not doesn't have an obvious solution, it takes her two and a half years to solve it. And I am talking like two and a half years of like intensive full-time work because when she makes this discovery, she is in her late 60s, early 70s. She's retired. She has a background in technology. She has a background in data management. And she's incredibly good with, um, you know, technological, um, the sorting of technological bits and bytes. And it turns out that she's like perfectly positioned to solve her own mystery and she has the time because she's just retired. Um, so along the way, she tries to figure out how it is possible that, you know, half of her DNA is not what she thought. And she goes through all the kind of obvious um, most likely scenarios that statistics show would be the most likely explanations, for instance, that her, her father uh, wasn't genetically related to her because of, you know, because of a, an extramarital affair, because of um, a donor conception, or maybe both her parents aren't related because of an adoption. Um, and she goes through the most likely sort of theories, and, and none of them are true. And that's sort of where the mystery deepens when she makes the discovery that her the explanation is not going to be easy or obvious and it turns out to be incredibly byzantine and it goes back a hundred years right and and i won't say what it is but like kind of uncovering it is like just that story itself is like it, it is really like an agatha christie um but you know along the way what what is she grappling with what does it mean to be jewish Right? Like, what does it mean to have half your DNA be Jewish and yet you were raised Catholic with, you know, Catholic, you know, Sundays, Catholic mass, large family of seven, 
right? Like some of her siblings went to Catholic school. I mean, can you claim that identity if you didn't grow up with it? And what's really interesting about Alice's family is among the seven siblings, each one had a different answer to that question. So, you know, you, you, you start to see towards the end of my reporting as I'm talking to all the siblings and some of them are saying, uh, because it all it turns out all seven of them are, um, are half Jewish. And some of them say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not Jewish. It's just DNA, but I'm Irish. And Alice says, oh, no, no, I'm Jewish. And this exploration of going back into the past to reclaim your identity and this question of the interplay of genes and ethnicity and culture and experience and what it is that's rooted in your cells, that is sort of the fundamental question that not just Alice is asking in this book, but in a way all of us are asking now because so many of us have done DNA testing and so many of us are delving into this genealogical inquiry. Wow. It was, I mean, literally goosebumps for me as I got <laughs> near to the yeah. The climax, I guess. I mean, like, even like the like, tear shed. I mean, it was just amazing. So, <clears throat> as she, like, as we, a lot of people on this call are Ashkenazi. So, we, right. as we explore our Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, as Alice did, are there some complexities with home DNA testing? Or does that help? Yeah. Does it help? Or are there additional, like, factors that come into play? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely harder for her, right? Um, and it's harder for us. Um, but not as hard as it was when she started, right? So it's a harder in general if you're if you're of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry or come from any um, group that is called is considered endogamous, which is the term for when you have a relatively close knit community where there are say like second cousins marrying second cousins, um, or you know like in my family we have I think like two sisters who married two first cousins. It's it's very very confusing and. Um, when that happens over and over in a relatively small community that's, you know, religiously um, kind of keeps keeps to itself, they're 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 isolated from from the outside world. Um, what happens is that people who are actually very distantly related, in more than one way, share enough little tiny segments overlapping that they appear to be more closely related than they are. Does that make sense? So instead of you and I being third cousins, we're actually, I don't know, sixth cousins and 10th cousins and fifth cousins. You see what I mean? In other words, we are related along multiple tracks. So our tree is, it's like, um, I don't know what the best analogy is, but it, you know, it's, 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 it's interlaced, the, the limbs are interlaced, right? Um, and so what does that mean? It means when, you know, how do these companies work? Well, back when Alice was doing her research, and to some extent now too, but they've gotten better at it. Um, how they determine your genetic relate? So when you when you take a consumer DNA tax through a company like Twenty Three Me or My Heritage or Family Tree DNA or um, Ancestry, um, they are telling you two pieces of key information. One is they're giving you this pie chart. They tell you, um, you know what parts of your ancestry, what percentages of your ancestry come from certain places in the world, say 500 to 1,000 years ago. So that's the pie chart. And that information is roughly reliable, but imperfect. And the other information is the DNA relatives. And that's really good at predicting like generally level of relatedness, if not the exact relationship, except in some cases for Ashkenazi Jews and other endogamous groups. And that's because um, you know, how they interpret relatedness is they look for spots along my, my chromosome where, you know, you and I overlap, right? Like little spots along the chromosome where we are identical. And if we are multiply related, but, but along several different more distant traps, we have a lot of little overlapping segments. And when you add them together, it looks like a great deal of relatedness when in fact it's not. So that's a very long story, a long answer, but the, the point is that what it means is that when you're Ashkenazi Jewish in some of these databases, you may have tens of thousands of results, and most of them are completely useless to you as far as understanding how they're related to you because they are so far back that you'll never figure out your connection. And that is the position that Alice is in. And then there are additional barriers to her 
particularly because the databases are so small back then, it's very hard to find anyone who's even, you know, a, a third or fourth cousin, right? Like even, and, and that degree of relatedness is quite, is quite difficult to trace back, but that would have been a, that would have been a stroke of luck if she was able, even, able, able even to find that. And then you have this problem of surnames that very often within the Ashkenazi community, if you go back and back and back, people didn't have surnames, right? They didn't have surnames in the way that they do now. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're trying to trace back past a certain point, you really can't. And um, at least through, you know, using um, like something called Y-DNA and surname continuity. So there's all these little methods that have been developed by citizen scientists to help hack your genes. And Alice is going for them. And because of the particularities of her population, she can't, they're not able to help her. Um, you know, the crazy thing is, for instance, like, you know, you look at certain populations with record keeping, like, um, for instance, on my on my father's side. So I'm Ashkenazi Jewish on my mother's side. My father's side were this amalgam of like, German and Swedish and British. And if you look back at my dad's British side, you know, there are people who purport to be able to trace our people back to 1063 or something like that, right? You cannot do that, generally speaking, with Jewish populations. You can't get back that far. I mean, I'm sure it's not quite reliable on my father's side. I'm sure there's all sorts of breaks in the chain. But the point is, you couldn't even go back in the records, right? Because the records don't exist because, um, because you know, the surnames don't exist. And so you really are at a disadvantage in terms of trying to be able to trace really far back. So this, all of this and more is what Alice faces. <laughs> so DNA testing, home DNA testing, I don't know that a lot of, of us on the call tonight know a lot about that, but with now 40 million people, 40 million people having taken such a test, you're saying in your book that we're at a tipping point. So like, what are the, you know, obviously there's a lot of privacy issues with that. I've got privacy issues just with my genealogical research and my cousin yeah. doesn't want to be put on my tree. But now yeah. with the genetic testing, what are the implications of that? Yeah. Okay. So there are, let's say like 22 people on this call. So I could say every single person here already has their DNA in one of these consumer databases. Now, what do you mean by that? I haven't taken a test. Well, the answer is you already have um many many cousins who have and because you share dna with those cousins you are effectively represented in that database what does that mean it means that um people are you know what they found is that people are effectively uh, identifiable from a generally from a third cousin match or closer and by the way i can't name my third cousins so if they were testing in the database and i was hardcore against it, it's not as if they could even contact me to ask me my permission. Not that they, not that they probably would, but I wouldn't even know their names. Do you see what I mean? Um, so the, the kind of, the secret sauce of genealogical, of genetic, genetic genealogical inquiry is not merely the databases accessible through consumer companies. It is the combination of that with social media with Facebook, with, you know, all the public records that are available online. So what does that mean? It means that if I am a child who was placed for adoption in 1976, and because the state I live in does not make my original birth certificate available to me, I don't know the names of my original birth parents, um, that no longer need limit me from discovering the identities of my birth parents. Even if my birth parents have never taken a DNA test, I can test and I can find, let's say, um, very easily, perhaps an aunt, um, but maybe not, maybe like a second cousin once removed. Even from that, I can generally, taking that and the power of the internet and all the information that's publicly available in obits and newspapers.com and all that stuff, I can generally narrow it down either to say two sisters within a family or, you know, maybe the, the actual woman who is my birth mother herself, right? Um, it means that, for instance, this concept of the anonymous sperm donor, which you know, a lot of men who sold their sperm for, say, $25 um, in the 70s um, and were told that they would be anonymous, they are no longer anonymous. And it doesn't matter what contracts they were signing or what promises they were made, and it doesn't matter if they ever do or don't take a DNA test, they are effectively outed. 
because somebody relatively close to them, genetically speaking, has taken a test, is in the DNA database. And so somebody else who's looking for their genetic father is going to be able to identify that genetic father by taking a test and matching to people who are genetically related to him. So it, it, it you know, it means that we have stumbled into this strange world without ever without ever stopping and considering it, and most of us without ever realizing it, we have stumbled into a world where, you know, you don't get to opt out of, of this um, for better and worse. And there are situations where it is absolutely life-changing and life-affirming for people to know their genetic identities. Um, but it is certainly an instance where sometimes your interests of, in privacy and my interests in wanting to know my genetic identity or my genetic relatives clash and, um, but, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it would have been resolved on the side of the, the secret keepers, right? If you had a secret and you didn't tell your child about the truth of their identity, you could generally keep it that way. And now it is almost always resolved increasingly on the side of um, transparency that, that, that there's no such thing as family secrets anymore. I, 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 I can't like underline that enough, the bigness of this moment. Because it, it means that, you know, it, it means that if you haven't told your child that they were donor conceived because they were donor conceived like in the 60s at a time when that was really stigmatized, it means they're probably going to find out. And if they don't find out, their child will find out and tell them. And so it, it, it has these vast implications for how the generations talk to each other and how much parents disclose to their children. It, it's completely game changing for families. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how GDPR and CCPA regulations that really support that opt-out capability where it's really regulated, how that's going to intersect with it. But I mean, that's probably why America's, you know, we're less, I guess, sensitive to those privacy aspects just because we're numb to it, I think. Right, and we're also like the country with, you know, we have pioneered DNA testing in many ways. We're home to most of the big companies. Um, you know, so there's, you know, there's a reason why it's all, it's been very popular and it sort of started here and it's been so popular here. So you talk and you write a lot about NPEs and those are fascinating, the different types of them and the different seekers that are doing that. How common are they in the general community? And also how common are they in the Jewish community? Is it different from the Jewish community for other compared to the general community. Right, okay, so and, and what's an NPE? And there's lots of acronyms and I'll use all of them because I think the, the community is still working out what they, what they um, prefer to be called. And there's a lot of folks now who prefer MPE, so there's both. So NPE means non-paternity event, which came from, it's like an old term from the genealogy world. And that eventually became um, like non-parental event to acknowledge that there are times, most often somebody is discovering that they're not genetically related to their dad. There are also times when someone's discovering much more rarely that they're not genetically related to their mom, you know, having to do with, um, you know, sometimes fertility method, I mean, donor conception, egg donation, that sort of thing. Um, or um, relationships outside of marriage, you know, a stepfather who, you know, Maybe they don't tell the child that that stepfather is the stepfather. They just call them the father, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another term that's now used is MPE, which stands for misattributed paternity, misattributed parentage experience. Um, but th these are terms where, you know, basically, generally, somebody's making a discovery that one or both their parents isn't genetically related to them. And that um, is a phenomenon that's as old as human beings. Um, but never has been discovered. I mean, it, it's never been discovered on mass the way it is now. So people have tried to gather data and the data tends to vary wildly, but um, it's probably in the low single digits. So somewhere around just under 2% of the population at large. Um, and what does that mean? Um, it, it, that sounds like not that much, but in fact, it's quite a lot um, for a number of reasons. So part of it is that um, if you extrapolate across the, now we're at much more than 40 million, I think we're certainly past 40 million people who've taken a DNA test through one of these big companies now. Um, and 
you extrapolate across those the two major types of surprises. One is discovering when your parents isn't related to you. The other is discovering you have a, like a sibling or half sibling you didn't know about. Those are the two most common that I would get, you know, most emails and letters about and that genetic genealogists get contacted about. Um, and those types of discoveries don't just affect the person who takes the test if they're, say, discovering that dad's not related to them or that they have a sibling they didn't know about. That's rippling across easily eight to 10 people. So you're talking about, you know, millions of, of people and millions of people across the world, and, and many of them, most of them are American, who are discovering that, say, you know, their dad wasn't honest with them or their mom wasn't honest with them, and maybe their parents are no longer alive and they can't even ask them anymore. And there's a lot of these crises of identity and crises of trust in parents um, or, or grandparents um, that people are experiencing right now. The phenomenon of the non-paternity event or the non-parental event or misdistributed parentage experience, and there's a lot of acronyms because this, this field is really like up and coming right now. It has become so well known as a result of DNA testing that there's, you know, there's nonprofits, there's, you know, grassroots organizations, there's therapists who specialize in this, there's organizations of therapists just devoted just to this experience. Um, you know, there's groups that have now lobbying and legal lobbying and trying to change laws around issues pertaining, you know, kind of that, that overlap with some of the stuff. So this is like, again, term no one heard of 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and it is now absolutely swelling. And that, again, directly attributable to the rise of DNA testing. Interesting. Yeah. How do you find... There's a lot of drama when the seekers and the family members that they're seeking intersect on the first contact or whatever. Yeah. And like, how do you find that the, that the different people respond to that? And then the second part of that is, do you see any differences between a ge genealogical genetic search compared to just a pure genealogical search? I mean, is there any difference or is it roughly the same? Yeah. Um... I'll start with the second question first, because, you know, for the genealogical search where you're working with records, you know, paper records, you're very often making discoveries that are further back in time. So, you know, for instance, I, I interviewed a genetic genealogist who was saying, you know, if you just work with the paper records, it's not unheard of to discover, for instance, that there are a lot of people who have sex before marriage right, back in 1890. How do you know? Well, you know, there's a lot of these shotgun weddings where there's like a wedding date and then a child is born seven months later, right? There's just not that many seven month term babies, right? So you, so you know that there are these kind of, you know, salacious scandals in families. It's not as if they don't exist in the record, in the paper record, they do. But that is very often emotionally removed from the seeker, from the person who's looking, because you're looking at, say, your great-great-grandparents' generation. You are not going to make those discoveries if you're doing straight, old-fashioned genealogy with the paper records in terms of your own, that you're not going to make that discovery, you know, um, in terms of your own immediate family. The difference is that with DNA, you are able to make a discovery that is extremely germane, extremely emotionally close to you, and extremely painful, devastating, enlightening, you know, polarizing, and you know, mind blowing, right? So it's 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 the likelihood of it happening, it's the degree, but it's also the closeness in terms of time and emotion to you. So it's it's just a bigger deal. Um, and in terms of how people react, I mean, the, the this. You know, I don't know if you remember at the end of the book, I kind of go into this idea of your truth versus my truth, you know, my right to know versus your privacy. This is one of the most fraught areas, right? Like, so for instance, if you're a woman who uh, placed a child for adoption um, at a time when being pregnant, you know, without being married was shameful and placing a child for adoption was painful. And then you married a man and you never told him and your marriage was sort of predicated on this omission, you know? Um, and here you are 
65 years later and your child discovers your identity through DNA testing and wants to reach out to you, it seems like given how much the culture has changed, like maybe in theory, it looks to an outsider like that, that woman who placed her child for adoption might be quite ready to say, oh, well, the past is the past, times have changed and I embrace you. But in fact, that's not how it is, right? She has never told her husband and um, what would he think of her to have held a secret for all those years? What will her oldest son think to know that he's actually not her oldest child anymore? How will the other children think when their sort of place in the family and birth order is, is completely changed? Um, will they feel um, violated, invaded? It's, it's funny because very often people do. They, they're very threatened by this stranger who comes into their lives bearing a great deal of, of genetic similarity to them. Um, you know, there, there are definitely families where they find a long lost sibling and they embrace them, but um, that is not always to be expected. I mean, there's many cases where people are cautious, they're scared, they're like, what do you want? Um, and there's this question of like, you know, what do we owe each other? Because, because we are related to each other, what do we owe each other? You know, um, it, it, it's, a, it's an incredible puzzle. Um, one of the genetic genealogists I've interviewed told me, you know, that, that, that basically they've resolved this question and they've come to the conclusion that you don't owe anyone a relationship just because you're genetically related to them, but neither do you have the right to deny them the knowledge of who they are. So if my birth mother, for instance, doesn't want to have a relationship with me, okay, she's certainly not obliged to, but I have the right, as many people see it, to know who she is so that I can know who I am. Right. I think you said it well. It's like the additional, I've met, I've come through genealogical, I've gone up and down, but typically met more distant cousins, but there hasn't been that psychological impact even if people haven't been like welcoming, they just are not interested, but there hasn't really been that psychological impact that there would be, I think, from the genetic testing. Right. So, um, you know, and then, but I think there's lack, there's still lack of interest or, or receptiveness in, in different ways. Um, so you talk about, interestingly, you talk about the case where genetic testing, personal DNA tests have been used to solve like murders. The yeah. Golden State Court, to be, for example. So, in your opinion, is it fair to be able to use those private DNA test results to alum to and from their family history or for anyone's family history to be able to solve that crime? Yeah, and this is like a really thorny area because when it started in 2018, people didn't know that their DNA was being used that way, and the databases where they had either tested or uploaded their genetic material didn't have clear policies around it. And it wasn't necessarily disclosed to the public how it was being divulged or used. So you had know, this kind of crazy situation where people's DNA, which, you know, it, there are certainly vast privacy implications for doing gen genetic genealogical research on your own family. But when you start talking about using that to arrest someone, that's like, it's another level of kind of intensity and seriousness. And some people don't want their DNA used that way. Um, so there, there's been this big debate and the companies have tried to resolve it by being very clear about who allows this use and who doesn't. So, you know, 23andMe, Ancestry, generally, you, you, you know, law enforcement can't access their DNA. Some of the other smaller companies, Family Tree DNA, for instance, GEDmatch, they actually work hand in hand with, um, you know, with law enforcement. Um, and they try to make it so that if your DNA is at their database, um, you have the choice, you know, you can opt out if you want um, of having your DNA used in this way. But I mean, it's really been transformative because um, you have cases, I've got loud children, um, you have cases where, you know, that, that were cold for 50 years that never would have been resolved, but for this, and all of a sudden DNA comes on the scene. Um, and so I think the, the central questions around this re re revolve around questions, are, you know, about 
the chain of chain of custody, how, you know, how is this information used? It, it's used generally speaking as a tip, but then they confirm it legally with a different type of testing, which seems to be the right way to do it because you would never want someone spitting in a vial to be considered, you know, there are so many issues with chain of custody around, you know, um, the way that your genetic material is, is sent to and handled by a consumer company. That's sort of like a gray area. So they use this sort of to um, find a likely person, but then they still have to go and let's say they're looking to discover the identity of a serial rapist from the 70s. They'll still go and sit outside his house and wait for him to, you know, throw his his dirty tissue in a trash bag out on, on a public street and then go through it and take that and match it to crime scene sample. So they've got this sort of um, bar where they're trying to meet, um, but they're also using the genetic genealogy to hone in on people. And there's a, there's questions around what kinds of crimes you use this for, you know, okay, so murder, sexual assault, um, but what about lesser crimes? Is that, is that a proper use? Um, you know, the, the sort of fascinating thing is, of course, there have been these government DNA databases for a very long time, but because they were designed with privacy in mind, they're not as useful. And so they actually don't help you find um, what these DNA databases, the consumer DNA databases can, are. they're incredibly powerful in terms of being able to give you information about who you're related to. For the same reason that I could discover my birth mother, or if I were donor conceived, I could discover my, my donor father, you know, fairly easily without them ever testing. Um, that's the same reason that you can uncover a serial rapist from the 1970s through these databases, because everyone's in there. Everyone in from America, every you know, so many Americans are in there. So, what practical advice, Libby, do you have for people on this call? Like, I haven't taken one. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I want to take one. For people that are thinking about now, you've piqued their interest, they want to take a home DNA test. What real practical advice do you have? So, um, I'm going to give you the yin and the yang, or the pro and the con, or whatever the analogy is. Um, I think it's important to consider, for, uh, I'm gonna, first of all, I will say it increasingly is not your choice, right? You, you haven't taken a test your sibling has, you haven't taken a test your child will, right? So if there's a secret in your family, it's gonna come out. And it is, it behooves the secret keepers, that generation to kind of grapple with that. And that is a very hard thing to fall in their laps. It is in many ways, incredibly unfair, um, but it's where we are. And increasingly there are professionals to help you with this. And that's like a whole other like kind of world that's opened up just in the last 10 years. So that's on the table. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a difference between making a discovery because your brother tests or your son tests or what have you, and then you taking the test yourself and then being the bearer of the discovery to the rest of your family. So I think it, it, it is important to consider whether you have the emotional bandwidth at this moment in time to handle a surprise. Because even if you think that it's not in your family, if you go out far enough, it is. Everyone's family has these secrets. That's what we've discovered, right? There's no such thing as a sort of like normal family with no secrets. They all have them. It's just a question of, of kind of how far out in the spokes of the wheel you go. So, um, you know, every person I've interviewed who took a DNA test and got a surprise said, yes, I knew it was statistically possible, but I didn't think the statistics would apply to me. Because why would you assume that that's, it's crazy making? You, you, you can go around with that much cognitive dissonance to think maybe I'm gonna discover that actually the mailman is my father, right? So, um, you know, just to have the knowledge that this could happen, and to consider the possibility that if you're making a discovery and then you have to take that big burden of news to your great aunt Rhonda and be the person to tell her, that's a lot on you, right? Or if you're contacted by the long lost so-and-so asking, um, you know, a lot of times people get contacted by say a long lost first cousin or a long lost half sibling and that person wants to make contact and then they have to be the navigator between their family and this other person, that's a lot. So it's, it's important to consider the possibility that, that you may not be ready for that at this time. Um, that's the yin and the yang. And then I'm gonna give you the just like, holy cow. The holy cow is, I'm in three databases, we've made astonishing discoveries. 
let me tell you about them. Right. And I barely get into these in the book because they mostly happen like after I wrote the book or like towards the end of the writing of the book, but like, holy cow. Right. So one thing is we found, um, and, and again, these would not have been possible without, without DNA. It's not something we could have discovered through the records. The records are not perfect. They don't exist. There are things that happened in families that didn't officially happen. So they're not in the records. So back on my dad's line, my dad's family, there's one strain that comes from Sweden. Uh, there's this, this guy, he wasn't such a good guy. He had a wife, he got her pregnant. He also got pregnant, this woman who lived in the village down the road. And um, so he had like two babies who were almost exactly the same age at the same time. And then he left and went to America. And one of those kids was my uh, great grandmother. So many years later, she um, emigrates to the United States to join up with her dad. She comes from Southern Sweden, it's very impoverished. She comes here. Um, she doesn't know it, but she has tons of siblings in America because of all the children that this guy's had in and out of his various marriages. Um, and meanwhile, the descendants of the um, child who was born down the road in the other village, they still live in Sweden. But we would not have known that we had present day living cousins in Sweden, right? Because this guy was, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't married to all the women that he was having children with. Um, and so we're doing this DNA testing, and this is years ago, when we find this woman with this kind of fascinating Swedish name, and she's in Sweden, and she's a, a you know, really <clears throat> dedicated genealogist, and she says, she, and she speaks English, and she messages us, and she says, I think we know how we're related, and we start to unravel it, and we make connection with her, and it turns out she's my dad's second cousin. We went to Sweden, and we met her. And she was able to like hook us up with people, show us like literally like my, where my great grandmother lived, the foundations of her farmhouse, it's still there. The church where she worshiped, it's still there. The school that she attended, it's still there. I was able to go and look at some of the old desks and like the graffiti that was etched into the wood, like, right? Not possible. And, and I will give you another story on my mother's side, and I'll, I'll do this one very quickly. We have family in, in Ukraine. We have a, a strain of, um, see, on my mom's side, her, her grandfather came from Ukraine in the early 1900s, Jewish Ukraine. We, he left behind siblings. We assumed the siblings died. We assumed all the descendants of the siblings died. We assumed that whatever happened to Jews in Ukraine in the 20th century, it was not good, and they were all not there, right? It turns out they were. It turns out they stayed. It turns out one of them became mayor of this tiny town. They all have the same name. It's Nemero, Nemirovsky. My, my grandfather was Nemero. Some of them moved to Israel. Some of them came to Brooklyn. We get on the phone with, again, my mom's second cousin in Brooklyn. He had grown up there. He had grown up in Ukraine. And again, right, not possible through the paper records. So yes, are there privacy concerns? Yes. Do we know where this world is going? No. Do we not know what we don't know? Yeah, that's a problem. And I am as cautious, you know, having done this research, I'm quite cautious about that. And I'm quite um, open, wide-eyed about it, right? Kind of open-eyed about it. But at the same time, wow. You know, to have access to the past, to have it next to you, to, be, to have it sitting next to you because you went to meet them. I, I can't even think of a better analogy for how small the world is and for how not far away the past is, for how intensely we can connect to the past because of this ability to meet our living relatives because of DNA. So that's the flip side and that's the beauty to, to being in these databases. Do you see the industry going more towards also providing in addition to like familial connections predictive for like medical and yeah, personal definitely. health histories? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like they dip their toes in and out, right? Like 23andMe is always on this, Ancestry goes in and out. I think my heritage has been doing it. There's all sorts of like implications. They're all trying to figure out where the money is, right? Because it's not really, it's not really in, I don't think it's really in Ancestry so much. I mean, it, maybe it's in the genealogical research, but the kids themselves are not, are not really the money makers. So you have to figure out how you how you use that information, right? Is it developing pharmaceutical drugs to treat cancer like 23andMe? Is it 
in, you know, investigating, um, you know, what particular drugs work with your particular genetic uh, makeup? Is it um, looking into whether you can predict how I'll, you know, sleep tonight based on my genetics? A lot of this stuff is not really ready for prime time, even though it's being sold. What diet should you be on to lose weight for your genetic makeup, right? That, that, a lot of that stuff isn't ready for prime time, but there's a lot of exploration to try and figure out who's going to make who's going to make those discoveries and who's going to make money off of them. Well, I can see how passionate you are um, I'm, about this whole area. I'm curious, how many total research hours did you spend on well, this? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I spent, thousands, I'm guessing? It was a three, it was a three-year project basically, you know, um, but it was a more than full-time project. Um, there were days when I would wake up and start working at nine and finish at 11 or midnight. Um, and I had little kids and it was, it was very intense. My husband was amazing. He was amazing. There were periods where I would go away for a few weeks and I would just work like, you know, 15 hour days. Um, there's a lot, it's, a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating world. But I think my favorite thing to do was to interview the people themselves. Like, you know, as much as it's interesting to do research on, you know, the science and the philosophy, the people themselves and talking to them, those were the most moving stories, you know, interviewing Alice and, and people like Alice, those stories are absolutely incredible. Which, which seekers did you make a more of a personal, which type of seeker did you have more of a personal connection with? Um, or was there one? They may not, not have known. Which you know, stakeholder? There's a woman who I, I, every time I would talk to her, I would like I would, you know, I would get upset. I would cry sometimes on the phone with her. Um, she had, she had been rejected over and over. She had, she felt herself to have been rejected over and over. She had been adopted. She had not been told she was adopted. Um, and so she makes this discovery through DNA. I mean, can you imagine not being told and then making that discovery? And, um, and then she made contact with, her biological mother's family and her mother had just passed her biological mother had just passed. And so her, and her, um, her newfound siblings didn't believe her. They were offended. They were like, what do you mean? Our mother was pregnant and placed a child for adoption. How dare you? Right. You can see again, how, how her reality clashes against their memory of their beloved mother. Right. What a, what a terrible threat to their memory. What a terrible position for them to be in. And at the same time, how could she know? She wanted to connect with them. She wanted to know if her mother ever asked about her. She wanted to know if her mother ever told me one. Turns out not, right? And, and there was this question that she would, said, I will never be able to resolve. And it's whether she ever thought about me or looked for me. And, and she felt this incredible sense of loss and not being able to know that she had that kind of, that mother's love at the beginning of her life she needed to know it and she never could know it and then she made contact with her genetic father and his family and he also rejected her so you know that kind of story it's tough it's really tough because it you know you can tell somebody well it's personal that they rejected you but man does it feel personal is that pain is just so incredibly painful for people going through that and unfortunately it happens more and more and these companies you know, they aid you in your discovery because they help you with the DNA piece, but there's no infrastructure to help people with the psychological and emotional fallout of this. Not, not certainly from the companies themselves. And that's where the mental health community is trying to step up. And that's where there are these sacred Facebook groups. And that's where there are these, you know, collaborations of people just trying to help each other and hold one another's hand. Because, because that's where we are. It's this basically grassroots approach to solving a massive cultural problem brought on by multi-million dollar, you know, companies with incredible technology, but the fallout is huge and there's no, um, there's no real support for these folks. So, so those stories, I think, I think those are the ones that would hit me the hardest just because I could feel the trauma of those. I could, I couldn't, I can't, I haven't experienced it, but I could feel in her voice uh, Linda's voice, the trauma of that type of that existence. How did you get people to open up? I mean, how did you, when you make contact with Alice, yeah. the seeker side, but also the people that were being seeked? I mean, I can't imagine. I think the first group would be easier because you're they're coming to you anyway. But the yeah. 
how did you get the other groups to open up or would they even open up I yeah mean, I mean the, the it was tricky with like so yeah people want to tell their own stories but like often the parents generation doesn't right so that was tricky um you know there was a guy that I I, I he just actually he emailed me like last week um he's I think at 26 children now from being a donor in the seventies. And, um, he was, you know, I had talked to one of his genetic children and then she connected me with him and it was very delicate. Um, but he was so, um, I think because he was open to meeting with his children, with his genetic children, he was open to talking to me. It's, it's more an issue when the person is denying it or doesn't want anything to do with it. Um, and, and, you know, it's so interesting. You never, you can't always predict who's gonna, who's gonna be like, you know, why is it that this man is like, yes, eight of you genetic children come over for Thanksgiving dinner with the two children I raised and my wife. Yes, please. And another man is like, I want nothing to do with you. This is frightening, right? Like ha it, it's such an interesting amalgam of characteristics and background that make people either open to this or not open to this. And there were certainly you know, men and women that I reached out to who did not want to talk to me or never called me back. So, um, and you know, who could blame them? It's difficult. It's a very difficult situation. I'm still amazed. Like to me, the science to some people may be dry, but certainly other people's family histories and their searches can be very dry. It's amazing to me how you sort of use literary devices and your expertise to bring the story out. Yeah. And yeah. honestly, that probably was like one of the main points to me because yeah. I've got a bunch of genealogical thousands of people, but there's very little stories. <laughs> and like, that's the best, one of my takeaways is how you were able to create those stories. It's amazing. It's, you know, it's, it, well, first of all, our own stories are always fascinating to us, right? And, and people come at you with an incredible amount of enthusiasm about their stories. But after a while, you can you can sift and you can hear five stories and you can tell that one of them is the most compelling. And so it's a question of kind of like interviewing so many people that at the end you have three really good stories. And most of the work then winds up on the cutting room floor because those stories are great and so fascinating to those people. But they don't necessarily have themes that are going to resonate with a broader audience. So unfortunately, you have to leave them, right? So it's actually just a labor of it's a labor of, um, of effort, right? It's, it's talking to enough that you wind up with a few. It's that like sifting through it's the needle in a haystack. Yeah. Well, it, it's an honor talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank and you. again, I'm kind of like with, you know, wishing that one day we'll see something like this on Netflix. Cause I think it's, it's amazing. I think if people just read your book and go through it, it's, it's, quite entertaining and educational. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and somebody, I'm just gonna read, there's a comment in the chat here. It says somebody says, I think a good amount of the distress of learning these family secrets is grappling with whether the discovered should carry any shame or guilt for their ancestor choices and how much obligation the discoverer has to share the information or continue to keep the family secrets is complicated. And I absolutely agree. Um, I agree and I think, um, on my father's side, we've made the discovery that some of our ancestors were enslavers within the last few years. And I've joined some organizations, there are groups now where you can join to, um, for people who are descended from enslavers. And ugh, um, it's, it's very uncomfortable and it's very heavy. Um, but I think, if enough of us look in a clear-eyed way at the past of America, I think we can be a better country, if that makes sense. Like, I think we have to grapple with the reality of it, and it's very dark. Um, and the beauty of it is that nowadays you see a lot of these kind of, um, I've attended some genealogical events, like at Roots Tech, where you'll see, like, two people who are very distantly related. One is descended from somebody who was enslaved and, and the others descended from one of the folks who enslaved that person, the other person's ancestor, right? So, and they're related, right? Because of the way that, that this institution worked. And they work together to share documents because very often the enslavers have documents 
and the enslaved descendants don't, right? Because they weren't important enough to be written about. They didn't exist. They weren't people, or so, or so our culture said. So, so part of the, I think the the privilege and the burden of knowing your past is to then say, okay, I have all this information. And part the, the reason these groups exist for people who are, say, descended from enslavers is to say, like, okay, well, I have all this information. I'm going to put it out here. Here's, you know, the books that they kept. Here's the names of the folks that they that they had enslaved, so that people who are related to those who were enslaved can look in the records and find their people. And that's a way that we can work with the past to. Um, to reckon with it in the in the present. So there's there's so much work that can be done, you know, culturally in terms of a reckoning around this stuff. Um, that's a very long commentary in response to what this person said. But yes, it's it's it it's very complicated. It's very difficult. So um, and somebody is messaging me that that happened to them too. So it's yeah, it's a it's a fascinating time to be alive. <laughs> In America, that's for sure. When is Jewish Gen going to have genetic testing? Or are they going to ever do? I think they're way behind the, the eight ball. I don't think they'll yeah. ever do it. Yeah, yeah, they haven't. They haven't gotten into it, have they? Yeah. Um, Just, yeah. stuff. GUB yeah. stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much, Libby. We're honored to have you, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. Any, I really any other it. final words, Jeanette? Jessica? Okay. Hi. Um, for everybody, my name is Jeanette Pincus. I'm currently the uh, president of Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And I just want to thank you both so much. This is a very special program for us. Deborah was very excited when she found you, Libby, and that she was going to be able to present this. And um, and Bernie, that was it. You were going to be the moderator for this. She just knew exactly who she wanted to do this, to do the interview. So this was the last um, program that she was able to do for us to plan. So it's very special. Um, for everyone else that's on, I just want to also tell you, if you're a member of our organization, thank you very much. And if you're not, we'd love for you to join us. And the way to join us is, is to um, get on our website, www.djhs.org, or call us at 214-239-7120. And there's also two more programs that, we've, that are coming up that I want to share with you because we'd love for you to come. You'll start seeing uh, things for us. Our annual meeting is Thursday, June 15th, and we're having it at Legacy um, Midtown Park. And we are having our program after our annual meeting is a panel discussion talking DFW sports, a Jewish perspective. And Mark Alfenbein, who's host of the Ticket Sports Radio, is interviewing Brad Sham, Chuck Cooperstein, and Robert Steinfeld. And they're getting the perspective on their life, being Jewish, and the sports that they love. So if we need to register for that. We would love to have you. And the next big thing we've got is in September, very special. Um, program, we are honoring community rock stars, I feel like, in our Jewish community. It's Jerry Finkelstein, Liz Lehner, and Marilyn Paylett with the Ann Loeb Socorro Humanitarian Award. And it's going to be on Thursday, September 28th. And we're having um, the Stoneleys, a Rolling Stone tribute band, and a seated dinner. And it's going to be lots and lots of fun with a silent auction, too, to really celebrate these wonderful women in our community. So I appreciate it again, Val. Thank you so much for everyone that has attended it. And thank you again, Bernie and Libby, for this. Thank appreciate you so much. Thank, thank you, Bernie. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.